Uh, uh, in this final session, uh, we, we've got a panel here that uh, uh, will we'll have a small attempt to uh, bring together some of the issues that have arisen during the day, uh, but uh, uh, will mainly uh, uh, bring out new dimensions of things that have been um, presented during the day. Uh, we've got uh, uh, eight people in the panel, uh, a bit crowded, and to make it, mani make it manageable, uh, those who have already presented during the day won't uh, present at the beginning. Uh, Yang Yao, uh, uh, Wing Tai Wu, uh, Li Gang Sung uh, will, will participate in the uh, panel discussion but won't make an initial presentation. No constraints on subject. It, the subject is uh, China's long-term prospects. It would be good if we could bounce as much as possible uh, from things that came up somehow or other during the day, but uh, feel free to bring up other big issues if you think they are the big ones that we've missed during the day. And so to uh, uh, start it off, uh, um, Professor Max Corden uh, from University of Melbourne for a long time here, uh, very well known to... Uh, to, to people who attend things in the Coombs building, so I won't say any more. Max. Um, there's been a fantastic conference as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've spent, uh, um, what was it, this year, uh, seven days in Beijing. That was the first time in China. I've written one article on China for the last conference, which I refer you to read on exchange rates and so on. And after one day here, I'm now a China expert. <laughs> <laughs> and I really think it was the most interesting conference. I congratulate the organizers you know, for, for it. And that's not one of those polite, nice sayings, because I've been to lots of boring conferences, and this was not boring. Okay? Now, I would like to make a comment right at the beginning about something that Hugh Mackay, who's here somewhere, said uh, at the end, right at the end. And I, I've just realized how significant it was to big issues. Now, he said something like the following, I can't remember his words, and a lot of big projects we have in, the, um, in his field, a lot of work we've got to do, and we need, our real problem is to get capital. Will we be able to finance all these big projects? That's rough, it's basically what he said, right? And let's assume he's right, and I hope he's right. Now that, in other words, he's saying, I hope there's going to be enough savings in the world to finance the good investment projects we have. Now think about it. What would you say you would want China to do from the point of view of the world economy? Would you want them to save a lot and put it on the world market as they have been doing? Or would, would you want them to take the advice of American congressmen <coughs> and uh, not save so much or invest it all at home, don't put it on the world market, and so world interest rates will rise? Now my understanding from Hugh was he would like world interest rates to be low and to be able to finance these projects. And he has good, pro there are lots of good projects. And we know that some countries like Australia and Brazil have good projects in mind, and there's no reason why we should uh, complain about countries that save and don't use it all at home, but send some of them abroad from a world point of view. So I think this very casual remark, if it's, you know, if, if you agree, if you still maintain it, is actually quite significant about our view about uh, 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 China's role in the world economy. And maybe it's not in China's interest to, uh, in, uh, to send so much funds abroad. Maybe it'd be better for China to use them all at home. But after all, China has got a very high rate of investment. Uh, and um, maybe c consumption should be higher. That's another matter. But from a world point of view, if anything, the world benefits from countries like China, and for that matter, Japan, or even Germany. I mean, it all comes to the same thing. The, the, the whole refrain we've had the last few years, that savings is bad, uh, is based on the assumption that there isn't enough good investment available. To, for using the funds. And what is true, if you look back, I'm getting away from China, but this is a general point. If you look back on the last few years, particularly since the crisis, a lot of those funds have gone in the wrong directions. They have financed consumption and not investment, to summarize it. Or they've financed, uh, to some extent, bad investment. A lot of it's gone to the United States. Now, if the United States had used those funds for improving American infrastructure, that would have been long, a long-term benefit. 
on the basis of which uh, America would have been in a position to repay and so on. Instead, it, well, maybe you might say the, the war that it financed is a kind of investment, if you believe that it was a good war. Uh, but in any case, uh, the houses that were built with the money, okay, that was, you could argue, that was a good investment. There's something left as a result. But the consumption, big consumption increase in the United States, that wasn't the way these funds really should have been used. And for that we must blame the financial sector, the way it's allocated the funds. Anyway, looking in the future, if there really are these great projects available, as we know they are in Australia and in Brazil, the two countries I can think of as, and I think in India they must be available, well then uh, we should take a different view about the prospect, macroeconomic questions than we had in the past. That's my main comment, and actually I've almost used up my time. Now I was supposed to talk about <laughs> Exchange rates. <laughs> now, the truth is, last year I wrote a paper which has been published in the volume of the conference volume here, which is available to all of you, I hope, and uh, which is also published in the economic, the British Journal, the Economic Journal. And I don't have much to add. The only thing I want to add is this: to fit in with the general theme that we're supposed to cover, namely the future and growth. Looking ahead, inevitably. China will have a floating exchange rate regime. Now, it might not happen immediately, it won't happen immediately. They'll be moving a little bit closer to it. But all uh, big countries have floating rate regimes. Now, you have to think of Europe as one kind. And when a country doesn't have, a, it's a part of a larger group like France and Germany, uh, well, Germany dominates the system. So, in a sense, Germany gets the gets the regime it really wants, operating via the European system. Smaller countries in Europe are, are limited in what they can do because they have a fixed rate. But all major countries, other than have floating rate again. It's a natural thing, and the basic reason is it gives them an independent monetary policy. So at the moment, uh, China can't really vary its interest rates, taking into account only domestic considerations, because it has to worry about uh, capital flows coming in, capital inflows on coming in on speculative reasons, or if there's a great divergence between, say, British, no, sorry, between American interest rates and Chinese interest rates, well, that will lead to undue capital inflow. So, to get a free independence of, of monetary policy, which is inevitable for China eventually, it will have a floating rate. Now, there's a transition period, and we have not time to talk about that. Okay. Five minutes are up. Right. Uh, thanks, Max. Well, well, that's a huge issue you <coughs> raised at the beginning. Uh, if Chinese surplus savings disappeared sometime between now and 2030, uh, then that would have a very large effect on global real interest rates. And countries like deeply indebted countries like United Kingdom, United States, Australia and Greece uh, would pr have an even greater challenge in, uh, in funding uh, their uh, uh, external accounts. So uh, that, that's uh, really an implication of a lot of the things we've been discussing because a lot of the discussion through the day has uh, uh, been uh, presuming that either as a result of uh, external pressure, United States pressure, or internal developments, rising real wages, falling uh, savings associated with that, then you will have uh, a substantial fall in Chinese savings. So that's uh, uh, something for us to uh, continue to think about. Now, uh, Peter Drysdale, Peter, well known here, uh, been uh, a central <coughs> part of the ANU's work on the East Asian economy uh, for more years than any of us wish to uh, cal oh, calculate. Peter. <laughs> thank you, Ross, for that nice introduction. <laughs> uh, I want to pick up uh, a, a sub theme that's been uh, running through all the discussion today, but relates to Max's point. Max's point is one dimension of this, really, which is uh, which is the sub theme of China's impact uh, on the global economy and how uh, that can be managed. Because if it's not managed well, uh, you can see problems down the track, not only for the rest of us but also for China. Uh, and uh, that really has to do with uh, what uh, China's impact will be on the global order. Uh, what's happened, fortunately, in the last couple of years is that there's been a fundamental change in the world's uh, economic and political order. 
around the establishment uh, of the G20 process following the global financial crisis. Uh, and China's and India's and a number of players' elevation into a global dialogue uh, on important economic, approximately, but political affairs down the track. Uh, and that's a remarkable thing when you think about it. Uh, the cession of power and influence uh, to the emerging powers like China uh, in the global system at one fell stroke as it's come through the G20 process. Now that's not uh, uh, well entrenched. Uh, there are risks associated with the way in which uh, the G20 already operates and might operate down the track. But at least there is now a platform on which uh, China can comfortably engage on important issues that confront it uh, and the rest of the world about its impact uh, on the world economy and, for that matter, the world political system. And uh, this is a platform which potentially, at least, China can take a lot that is positive too, because the nature of the process we have in the G20 uh, is uh, one, that it's voluntary, uh, and anything you take to it is taken independently to it. It's rather like APEC, unless you put into it, you don't get out of it. Uh, so. Uh, uh, it will succeed and China will succeed in the process of establishing uh, and socialising its own legitimate interests in the global system only if it takes something important to that table. And what I want to do in the next and final few moments is say a bit about uh, what China can bring to the table uh, and then what some of the risks uh, might be uh, in, uh, uh, in that process. I should say at the beginning that uh, perhaps like some of the other big emerging powers, India for example, uh, you know, China uh, comes uh, to the established world order, uh, even pre-G20, uh, uh, with a degree of comfort, uh, at least uh, on the surface of it. Uh, China is already a member, of, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, so it has an established place in international political affairs. Uh, WTO was all there in place and provided uh, uh, the engine whereby uh, the uh, world system engine whereby uh, China could uh, uh, accommodate its interests in the global economic system uh, through working towards. Uh, establishing through its own policies effectively WTO norms and eventually accession to the WTO and achieve the ambition of integration in the international economy. Uh, so on the surface of it at least, uh, it, it seems that uh, China really is working very comfortably within the established order. But there are some issues down the track. And uh, China also has a dynamic element the most dynamic element in the Asian economy, takes to the process of recovery from the global financial crisis a lot that's positive. Uh, it takes uh, a dynamic economy that's switched around rapidly, albeit uh, with not quite the same uh, decisiveness that it addressed the problems associated with the Asian financial crisis. It didn't take quite the same current, uh, coherent and purposeful uh, economic diplomatic agenda uh, to the world that it did uh, in the Asia financial crisis, but nonetheless uh, one that uh, in China's own interest uh, served the interests of the world by shifting around very rapidly on policy settings in China and uh, uh, began uh, a dynamic recovery process that impacted favourably on a lot of countries including this one. Uh, and China is engaged in a huge process of structural reform which really is at the guts of what uh, the business, as we've heard today, what the business of correcting uh, economic imbalances is all about. Correcting national economic imbalances uh, in terms of the distribution of the benefits from growth in the Chinese economy, but also correcting international economic benefits in terms of the malallocation of uh, uh, savings and investment around the world. Uh, and these are very positive things, but yet China stands back and is rather cautious about taking this agenda forward uh, in the G20 process, for example, but also independently in 
the articulation of its economic diplomacy. Uh, and one must, one, one must wonder why that is so, because China would have so much to gain, as I said, uh, through socialising and legitimising its interest in the international economy, it took a very strong agenda forward on that. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I end with a few questions about uh, how China will manage this process and why China is managing this process in the particular way it's managing at the moment. And some of my co-panelists may have some answers to these questions. A real question is, I suppose, uh, revolves around the question of whether uh, China will continue to be a regime taker, uh, uh, a regime taker in the way that has been congenial to its interest up to this point, whether it can continue to do this, or whether it has to become more of a regime maker and pursue a proactive uh, international economic and other diplomacy uh, which legitimizes its interests in the global economy and the global system in a way that they're not quite legitimized. And uh, let me say just uh, a little bit about that by way of footnote. What do I mean by that? I mean by that uh, that, uh, you know, we've heard today another sub-theme in the conversation is how important the development of an open and representative systems of government at various levels <coughs> might be in respect of dealing with the whole range of Chinese problems. I also would add how important that might be in dealing with a whole pro lot, lot of problems uh, for China in its relations with the rest of the world, in particularly, of course, with the big industrial economies, who are its main uh, protagonists as well as its main complements in the international economic system. So while, as I said, superficially, China has much uh, at this point uh, to benefit from in the established uh, regime, uh, it, it also has a big challenge, really, in the transformations it must make in terms of its, its economic diplomacy, but also in terms of its political system and the way in which that impacts on its international diplomacy in carrying forward uh, all the complex problems that are going to arise uh, in its economic and other interactions uh, in the global system. We have a framework within the G20 within which China uh, can develop these things purposefully, uh, but at this stage the hesitation makes one worry makes one worry about the risks that there might be down the track in delivering on this uh, important objective. Thanks, Peter. Uh, now, Professor Alan Fells. Uh, Alan uh, is director of the Australian New Zealand School of Government, uh, based in Melbourne, but with tentacles right through Australia, New Zealand, maybe soon Papua New Guinea. And uh, uh, Alan formerly uh, uh, head of the Australian uh, uh, Competition uh, uh, Regulatory Authority uh, and uh, now uh, an advisor to the Chinese government on such regulatory matters. Alan. Um, thank you very much, Ross. In my five minutes, I want to talk about briefly a matter bearing on the internal efficiency and on structural reform inside the Chinese economy, uh, and that is competition law and policy in the light of the adoption in 2008 of the anti-monopoly law. Um, three brief points about competition law. First, I distinguish between traditional competition law, antitrust law and so on, and uh, that's the prohibition of business engaging in cartels, anti-competitive mergers, abuse of dominance, which is what the law is mainly about, and the much wider subject of competition policy which is also about government restrictions on competition at every level of government in every sector. Um, um, we need to talk about that wider concept. Um, secondly, when you're talking about competition law and policy, it is different from some areas of economic reform. For example, if there's a trade reform, then the big question might be abolishing a quota reducing a tariff. When that's done, there's no work left for the government to do. Competition law is the opposite. When you adopt a competition policy, there's 50 years ahead of implementation. Implementation and enforcement, whether it's done intelligently, whether it's done properly, vigorously, etc., that is the main test of how well a competition law works. And thirdly, 
A competition law and policy has a very big effect on individual property rights. Um, it deals with huge rights of people to ownership, to make contracts and so on. Inevitably, it's a very difficult thing politically. All those things are relevant to China, which in 2008, after 14 years of drafting, adopted an anti-monopoly law. Um, that process had some good effects. It consulted everyone and adopted world best practice, although it added a few Chinese characteristics. That delay also obviously reflected big disagreements within China about the adoption of such a law. Um, the law has conventional prohibitions on cartels, anti-competitive mergers, abuse of dominance. Um, it has various enforcement arrangements and sanctions. Um, the enforcement challenge obviously is huge and even just listening to today, uh, anyone can see the enforcement problem of competition law will be very great. Uh, the resources of the agencies are not very big. Um, the, um, one of the stipulations is that um, the national authority can delegate to regional, state, local governments the power to apply the law, but that immediately runs into significant conflicts of interest between what those local governments want to do in exploiting their own monopoly rights. Uh, there's a whole lot of questions about how easy it is to apply a law in a country that is not particularly familiar with adopting the rule of law. Uh, the agencies are not independent agencies in the way that we are used to. There's a mass of political problems that lie ahead in the implementation of the law. But we shouldn't underestimate the possible effects over time of a competition law. Uh, they have had very substantial effects over time in most countries. Um, the law has got a bit of a Chinese character. I can illustrate that by reference to the first rejection of a merger proposal. Coca-Cola wanted to take over a local fruit juice company. The Chinese competition agencies spent weeks, months, trying to find a respectable reason for doing so. They finally came across one, based interestingly on an Australian precedent, but the question is whether the rejection was really that they didn't want a foreign acquisition of an emerging significant Chinese company. Um, the early experience of the law is that it has been sensibly applied, there have been no big mistakes, but it's just a bit early to call. Now, regarding state-owned enterprises, the law is ambiguous. There is a provision about state-owned enterprises which can be interpreted any way you like as a total exemption or as coverage, but the coverage is subject to other laws that stipulate what SOEs do and so on. And in practice, the SOE issue is unresolved. In any case, um, if you think about it, competition law does not really have much impact on the traditional SOE monopoly. Now, the cartel law is irrelevant. If it's a monopoly, there's no one to collude with. The merger law is irrelevant if there's no competitor to merge with. The abuse of dominance to exclude new competitors is irrelevant. So if you are thinking about SOEs as monopolies, you need something deeper that addresses entry restrictions, restrictions on interstate trade, uh, restructuring of those SOEs and so on. That is the subject of the wider subject of a national comprehensive competition policy which Australia incidentally has led the world in having. Now, um, another huge question is regional restrictions on competition. Um, as you all know, there are, there's a huge amount of local, excuse me, local protectionism in China. Uh, this, of course, has been a problem 
in uh, OECD countries, but we have tackled it because of strong political support and strong legal mechanisms. The strong legal support occurred when we formed nations. When the United States, Australia, Canada, etc., uh, had its states form a nation, part of nation building was to have mechanisms to prevent any restrictions on interstate trade and commerce. Does China have the same political drive behind it? Also, we have made um, the re removal of restrictions on interstate uh, trade the subject of meta laws, our top laws. It's in our constitutions. It's in the Treaty of Rome. So that's another uh, very, very deep commitment to solving this problem in OECD countries. Does China have that commitment? Well, the anti-monopoly law is a compromise. It simply prohibits the abuse of administrative monopoly like that. But if you read it, it has quite weak enforcement mechanisms, again reflecting deep divisions in the policy-making community. And then on the wider question of the many other government restrictions on competition, again, the treatment is slightly ambivalent. Firstly, I'm glad to see that these things are picked up in the law, but it will be a very, very difficult challenge in the years ahead to actually make them have an effect. So um, this subject probably requires a bit more than five minutes, but that's just to give you a bit of an indication of how I see it. Well, that's just a taste, and uh, uh, just as uh, Andrew reminded us uh, that there's a big gap on uh, Social Security, uh, mm -hmm. Alan being here reminds us uh, of our gap on a number of microeconomic reform issues, including competition policy, so we'll have to get him to do a chapter next year. Uh, now move to uh, Professor Stephen Howes. Uh, Stephen, originally a master's graduate from here, and I was the uh, first beneficiary of his excellent uh, education uh, when he worked with me on uh, Australia in the Northeast Asian Ascendancy in the late uh, 80s. Did a PhD at, uh, with Nick Stern at, uh, uh, at, at the London School, and uh, uh, subsequently uh, World Bank Chief Economist in India. Uh, Chief Economist of uh, uh, OSAID, and uh, we're all very glad that he's made a long-term base here at ANU. And his, and his connection with China is that uh, in uh, our work together in the Ghana Climate Change <coughs> Review, uh, Stephen had responsibilities for the international parts, and uh, you don't get very far into that without getting deeply into China. Stephen. Uh, thanks, Ross. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honour for me to be on this panel, although I've got to say it's, uh, I feel quite comfortable with you looking over my shoulder there, Ross. <laughs> Something I'm used to. Uh, I won't say I'm out of my depth. Perhaps I'm a bit of a fish out of water. I forgot to put my tie on this morning. But also in a session on uh, long-term growth, I'm going to talk about short-term uh, climate change mitigation prospects. And why is that? Paradoxically, uh, in climate change, it's a short-term uh, that counts. You know, once we get to the starting line for mitigation, uh, we have a good idea of how economies uh, will evolve uh, with a gradually increasing uh, carbon price. And if you don't have uh, that idea, uh, read the, the latter chapters of the Garneau Review. So the key question is, uh, where are we in relation to the starting line? And uh, for no country is this a more difficult or a controversial question uh, or important uh, than for China. Uh, important not only because China is the world's largest emitter, uh, but because its emissions are growing very rapidly. Between 2000 and 2009, carbon dioxide emissions from industry, that's the biggest single source of greenhouse gas emissions, leave China out and they, they grew at less than 1% worldwide because of the effect of the, the recession. Uh, China's growth, annual average growth for that nine year period, 9.4%. China is responsible for 72% of world growth in emissions over that period. So, key question, but difficult. There are all sorts of views out there. You've already heard some of them. You know, is China leading the world in mitigation, right? Or did China destroy uh, the Copenhagen conference? 
Uh, I can't hope uh, you know, to get to the bottom of this, but uh, I want to have a, try and shed some light on it uh, by going back to this 20% target that's already, that came up in the last session. So this is China's most immediate uh, climate change target to reduce energy intensity of the economy by 20% this year. This year. You know, unlike Australia, we're still talking about targets, they have a target. 20% this year relative to 2005. You know, I've been following this for a while and uh, was a bit sceptical about the progress China was making and was uh, very interested this, early this year when they made an announcement that they've got 14% between 2005 and 2009. That's pretty good. If you're going for 20% in five years, you've got 14% in four years. Uh, it makes it seem like you're pretty much on track. So I decided to try and calculate the number myself from the data and I got 8%. I put a blog up on this and I got various comments back and then I went to China and no one in China could tell me how you actually calculate that number. Right? We're not talking about verifying it, we're just talking about calculating it uh, from, from the data. There are lots of changes going on in uh, Chinese GDP data that was mentioned before in the energy data. Uh, it's a very complicated picture. Since then, actually the official data has announced that energy intensity has gone up. Uh, and even more subsequently, the, the iron hand policy policy has been announced and it's been said we will get this 20% target. Uh, so to try and you know, get some idea, I've gone away from energy intensity, I've kind of given up on that, uh, and just looked at some intensity of other sort of proxies for energy intensity. Uh, so let me tell you a few of those. Uh, look at steel production relative to GDP since 2005, it's increased by 15%. Uh, look at electricity from coal, it's increased by 12%. Uh, cement, 10%. Only oil has fallen relative to GDP. So it, whatever's happening, uh, we've got a lot of very energy intensive uh, production going on. And then if, you know, ultimately we're concerned about energy because we're concerned about emissions. And you know, Ross and I worked together and we did some projections for China. And it was just before the great crash. And so we thought, already we were being criticised for being too pessimistic. And we thought, gee, we're way off the mark. We said China would grow at 7.5%, China's emissions 7.5% between 2005 and 2015. Between 2005 and 2009, great crash notwithstanding, they've exceeded that target, 8.4%. Chinese emissions are growing uh, very, very fast. Uh, why is that? I don't have time, because of the strict timekeeping here, to uh, go into that. It's clear they're doing something. Uh, Zhang Zhongxing mentioned a number of the policies they have in place. So it's clear they are putting in policy effort, but it's clearly, it's clearly not enough. You know, this is an industrial juggernaut. And for the average developing country, their emissions track their GDP. It's clear China's going to have to do a lot more if it really wants to be considered to be making a significant contribution and, and to achieve its 2020 target. Well, then the question is, is China going to do more? No, they're not doing enough now. Are they going to do more? Uh, and, and the answer to that is clearly yes. You know, there are indications that there could be a, uh, a carbon price, a fairly low carbon price uh, introduced. Uh, but how much more? You know, are they really going to get serious about this uh, mitigation? And uh, this is where I think, you know, we can't, we can't, we can no longer, we have to halt the analysis in terms of thinking about China in isolation. We can't answer this question about how much China will do without thinking about what the United States is going to do. Because at the moment, the US can't put any pressure on China. The US can only welcome, gratefully, anything that China does. Uh, because the US, you know, is, isn't doing, is hardly doing, uh, well, you can't say it's doing nothing, but it's not doing enough uh, itself uh, to put pressure on China. And it's not realistic, in my view, to think that China is going to leapfrog the US. That the emerging superpower is going to put itself in a global leadership role on, on this issue. And, and take global leadership uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the US. Uh, in my view, uh, US ambition uh, is going to be a limiting factor on, uh, on Chinese mitigation. So for me, the most critical determinant of uh, China's climate change policy in the future is uh, US policy, and in particular the US Senate. Right? The US House has passed a bill. There's a bill before the US Senate. It doesn't look like the prospects are very good, uh, but they're not, uh, they're not zero either. It's not that China is a passive player, China can influence US policy. The more China does at home, the more influence, positive influence it has for the US. The more flexible China is in international negotiations, uh, I think uh, that'll, that'll help the US. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to be up to the US uh, in, in the US Senate. 
So in my view, uh, going back to this idea of whether we're at the starting line, or where are we in relation to the starting line on this long uh, mitigation uh, journey, uh, in my view, China's come a long way. Uh, the United States has finally you know, started to move. We're, we're close to the starting line, uh, but we're not there yet. China can help the US get to the starting line, but ultimately, uh, it'll, be, it'll be up to the US. Uh, so if we see the US Senate uh, pass that bill, I think we will see uh, very rapid uh, policy developments uh, in China uh, curbing emissions growth, not, of course, uh, turning emissions growth negative, but significantly slowing them down. Uh, but if the US uh, continues to abdicate that leadership role, uh, then my own prediction is that Chinese emissions will continue to grow very rapidly indeed. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Stephen. And to get the panel moving, I'm now going to ask the uh, three members of the panel who presented earlier today, and, and so not now, uh, to uh, make comments on uh, issues that have been raised by others in the panel presentation, starting, starting with Yao Yang. Well, I, I, I want to follow uh, Professor Zhao's uh, talk about uh, demography. Uh, as Professor Zhao uh, said, uh, demography is uh, very predictable, and we know what's going to happen in 30 years or even 50 years. Uh, uh, the, the, the problem with China is that uh, we have had uh, a very restrictive family planning uh, for 30 years. And that changed the trajectory of China's demographic transition. So by and large, uh, starting in the early 90s and until today, and then maybe another 15 years ago, uh, China is very extraordinary uh, in uh, the aspect of demogra demographic transition. That's also why China saves uh, so much today. Right? We, as I said in the morning, we saved uh, more than 50% of GDP for the last 10 years, and we are going to do this maybe in the next 10 years or so. Uh, that also linked uh, with Professor Corden's uh, uh, comment. Uh, I think that's also very important. That is, China is now providing this uh, cheap credits uh, to all over the world, and that actually uh, sends benefits uh, to the rest of the world. But uh, sooner or later, China is going to lose this extraordinary period of, of demographic transition. And the thing is that China is going to quickly enter an aging society, and China has to face the problem that uh, Japan is facing today. Um, but the, uh, you know, this is uh, almost certain we are going to face the, those problems. Uh, uh, in, in 15 years, 20, uh, 15 to 20 years, my generation will become uh, like a 65 uh, to a 70. That's the highest point uh, of China's uh, aging uh, uh, issue, I think, because uh, uh, we are the generation of baby boom in the late 1960s after Great Famine. Uh, I'm not sure the Chinese government has uh, prepared for that. Because uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, family planning policy has not been changed, or there are no signs to, uh, for change in the near future. So that uh, raises the question: Why uh, the leadership uh, is not doing anything for that? Because this is uh, so predictable, so certain. Um, you know, that's uh, that's my question. I don't know. I really don't have an answer to that. You shouldn't raise questions that are that big without giving us an answer. <laughs> uh, uh, Wing? I'd like, to, I'd like to start off taking up the question of is China is, a yeah, regime, is, this yeah. is China a regime taker or a regime maker? I think China's contradiction or, or maybe I should use the word confusion, lies in that it wants to operate on both levels. China's international engagement can roughly be described as being a regime taker of the conservative type at the international level and being an increasingly 
aggressive regime maker on the regional level. Let me uh, justify what I just said. On the international level, China has turned out to be very much for preservation of the status quo. For example, it is implicitly against the expansion of the Security Council of the United Nations, blocking the entry of India and Japan in particular. China does not see a need to take aggressive leadership in the Doha, in, in the developed world's uh, position in the Doha round negotiations. So China is satisfied as long as the Doha, the, the multilateral trading system does not take the turn towards uh, more protectionism, but it's not working hard to expand it. And China is not an aggressive pusher for new institutional com global compacts like the exemplified by the Copenhagen summit. So I think China's attitude is on that is like, leave me alone, let me get rich first, and then I will help you on all the other global materials. It's like, let me get rich first, and then I help clean up the environment. So that's one level. The second level is on the regional side, where China is much more active in proposing regional reorganization, like ASEAN plus one free trade area. And uh, it is more assertive about uh, where to draw the lines in the South China Sea. For example, it began with the, with the statement that we would enter into collective accusation with the ASEAN nations on the use of mineral resources in the South China Sea. And now that is no longer China's position on this issue about mineral resources in the South China Sea. And China has now declared moving beyond the first island chain of defense to beyond. And we could see that this engagement of the international community on two levels is a strategy that makes the US unhappy and suspicious. Unhappy because China is not contributing to the solution of global problems. Like for example, specifically I mentioned, nuclear proliferation. And it makes the US suspicious because it seems to be taking advantage of the US retreat from the world in general. The fact that Obama committed more troops to Afghanistan with the condition, with, together with the simultaneous setting of a date of withdrawal for the troops, I think is quite symptomatic of the, a growing trend in the US towards isolationism, which explains the rise of the tea partiers, or what, what's the tea baggers, or tea, the, the tea party movement in the United States, as, as, uh, as uh, best documented by Sarah Palin's point, that she is qualified to talk about foreign policy because she can see Russia just across the ocean. <laughs> Not that she has ever had the desire to go over across the ocean and see what lies there. I think, uh, I think it is not, I think the suspicious, suspicion is generally uh, unwarranted. I think it truly comes from the Chinese not having thought up about what its international obligations ought to be and what its bargaining position ought to be on important uh, international issues. Now, on, uh, let me move on to another issue about the world is full of advice to China on how to rebalance its economy. The first use of the word rebalancing, as far as I know, comes very explicitly in the following form. China should consume more, and that means, since that means a rise in aggregate demand, to, 
reduce inflation, China should invest less. It's always pointed out, increasingly pointed out, China invests over 40% of its GDP, and that is much harder than anybody else, so China is investing too much anyway. That particular recipe of rebalancing makes no sense on two fronts. First, it makes no sense in terms of its effectiveness in reducing the trade deficit. Because consume more means to save less. So that contributes to reducing the trade deficit. But if you also invest less at the same time, the effect on the trade balance is ambiguous, number one. Number two, to tell China to eat more and invest less is to tell China to catch up with the rest of the world slower. It is not possible to grow at the same rate as before if you invest less than before. Because growth means expansion of production capacity. Unless there's a technological breakthrough that allows China to produce more with less capital, that is not possible. So what is the national, the one thing that has consensus in Chinese society is to catch up with the rich countries. And how could you tell China, grow slower, and to, to say that there's such a thing as consume more, invest less, and you will grow the same as before. And why is China having such a high investment rate? The big difference between China and the rich countries is that the per capita amount of capital stock, the amount of capital per person in China is much lower than the rich countries. And what is the investment rate, I over Y? That is the rate at which you catch up to the capital stock per person of the rich countries. Since China wants to catch up fast, its investment rate is unprecedentedly high. So I think that uh, we could talk about re uh, re rebalancing, but in the tr form that it is normally used, it's not a, a recommendation that China recognize as to its best interest. Okay. Thanks, Wing. Uh, there's another possibility, rebalancing by expanding investment faster, growing faster, uh, and uh, catching up more quickly. Or uh, with Max idea, import intensive investment, mm. right? Same, same point. Yes. Yep. Uh, Li Gang. Uh, thanks, Ross. <coughs> what has been achieved in the past 30 years in China is, uh, is, is remarkable. But however, the, uh, we see the evidence shows that it's uh, become increasingly difficult for China to follow the similar model it had in the past 30 years. For four reasons, economically, China faces the uh, real challenge of domestic rebalancing domestic structures. And uh, socially, you know, China faces the you know, rising income, income, income inequalities and also need to be uh, tackled. And uh, we know the, uh, in, the, in the afternoon, the, uh, environmentally, China faces the enormous problem, the challenges in dealing with the, uh, the low carbon and environmental uh, issues. And also, uh, internationally, we know the, uh, the global imbalances, so China has to, to adjust. So what is the key? What are the key things uh, in dealing with all the issues or confronting all the challenges? I think the key thing is the, about structural changes or structural reforms. And uh, I remember this, uh, Professor Cardo said, is that in order to, for the uh, success, in order for the structural changes to be successful, one of the key conditions is to increase the domestic effective demand. So China now is facing the problem, is facing that as a weak domestic demand because of the structural problem. So one thing, for China to do right now is to through the uh, structural changes, like uh, to increase the domestic demand. One one area is to uh, our study shows is actually to liberalize, uh, to to urbanize the migrant workers in order to change their behavior of consumption. And uh, the data shows that is the behavior of uh, consumption are very different of uh, of uh, migrant workers compared with the city residents. Remember, there's a 160 million migrant workers working in cities. So if their behaviors change, and as a city dwellers, 
so the uh, consumption can be substantially increased. That will require very substantial institutional changes as identified in the afternoon. <coughs> Another issue is that we're looking at the long term about 20 years of reform and development. So next phase of development, perhaps, with, as a result of a radical change of a structure, so China has to cope with the, uh, the shifting of industrial base from labor intensive to capital intensive now, and perhaps later on move on to the, uh, the technological intensive. So prepared for that is the, uh, the human capital. So I quite agree with what Yao Yang said, so the importance of investing in human. And uh, perhaps the third dimension is, is about uh, you know, 1.3 billion increases to 1.4 or 5 billion people. And uh, so the, uh, the resource constraint on the development of China is also uh, posing a, a tremendous challenge. So that, that is the, uh, something we really need to have a further study uh, in looking at the challenges, especially with re regard to the global, imbalance, global balances between the supply and the demand of key resources, including energy. Thanks, Li Gang. Now we'll have uh, questions or comments uh, from, uh, uh, from anyone uh, present. But let's try to uh, make it a more integrated discussion by relating them to things that have been said in the, in the panel. Uh, to, Thank you very much, uh, Francis Ventura, student at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'd like to tackle the sort of growth of um, China's international uh, reputation more so than um, its economics. So just regarding its global image and respect for human rights. Um, and just to bring up a few examples, it has um, recently jailed Liu Xiaobao for 11 years for um, political um, activism. It um, continues to support the North Korean regime. It um, uh, continues to provide military equipment to the genocidal regime in Sudan. Um, does that send the message to the rest of the world that it, it is um, the Chinese Communist Party is more interested in its own political and economic interests rather than the moral consequences? Thank you. Uh, thanks. We'll, we'll take a, f a few questions. Let's take them on the theme of the international dimension of China's development first, then we'll come back to other questions. So, China in the world. John. Thanks. Uh, John Fitzgerald, Ford Foundation, Beijing. Thank you, presenters, for a very stimulating set of presentations, particularly this last round of discussions. I think when the question of demographics comes up, new turning points come onto the agenda as well. I'd just like to, to pose one possible turning point um, that might come up, perhaps not in the next 20 years, but 30 might, might not be too far out. And that's the point at which China's total labour supply, total labour market is saturated and cannot meet um, the demand for labour. And it's in the provision for serv of services for aged people or to maintain the momentum of its current economic model. There must come a point, or there might come a point, at which China is a net international uh, migration uh, country, into which significant international migration flows need to make their way into China. And the sort of closed box picture that we generally have of internal migration might at some point meet another turning point at which, which we haven't yet predicted, of significant international labour in migration. And I'm just wondering at what point one would begin to think about that hmm. in projecting into China's future, whether it's possible, given that demographics is so predictable, as some of the speakers have been saying, whether it's not possible to say so now, in fact, when that's likely to happen, or what conditions would be necessary for that to happen, what the scale, um, what, on what scale it would take place, and at what rate or pace would it, for example, come to overwhelm the total labour in migration of all other countries. I, mean, I can imagine this might happen if you think about the scale of the country, the rate of its development, and the point at which the labour market um, is basically uh, no longer capable of meeting demand. So the question is about 2040 or 2050, could there be significant regional international implications of China's demand for international yeah. labour and at what scale for yeah. and from where? T a terrific Thanks. question. I'll, I'll get uh, Jung Wei to think about it uh, and when, when the panel responds uh, he, he can take that on. That's a question that will have 
bigger implications probably for a number of other countries than for China. Um, please. Yu Sheng from uh, Avia. My question for the uh, whole panel is that, I mean, uh, the past 20 years, China's uh, rapid economic growth generate, I mean, dramatic demand for the resource and energy from the world. Well, at the same time, I mean, uh, as the urbanization process goes on, uh, what's the implication of the further development may drive the demand for food from the, I mean, from the whole world? Uh, in, other word, in other words, I mean, what's the implication of China's uh, uh, development I mean, for the food security uh, issue? Thanks. Please. Um, I think it's just a, a question about the overall resources. Um, there was talk about uh, Human Kai said uh, he was fairly bullish about supply of resources. Um, I think that's true for certain minerals or so iron ore. There's and coal. There's plenty of, but we certainly hear of there being shortages of oil, and it sounds like um, deep sea drillings. Um, uh, been seen to be pretty risky at the moment. Um, and the other thing is, is uh, I agree with the food security thing is, is very interesting given that as people become wealthier they also want to consume more protein, animal protein, and that consumes more grain which otherwise was feeding people. Um, and the last thing is about uh, um, population and just projecting a little bit further from where you're saying the population peaks, what happens in the, in the few decades after that? And I guess what we're going to see in Japan uh, in the next 20 years when those 80, 90, 100 year olds actually do die, um, how that's going to affect things. Thanks. Uh, and last uh, question on this theme of China in the world, and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, my question's for Professor Wu, um, Ian Chong again from the National University of Singapore. Um, so the sort of picture that you've laid out for us is one of China where, that is internationally a free rider. Um, and regionally, you know, trying to establish, um, I guess, its, its own writ. Um, but I'm wondering what incentives are for China to act otherwise. Um, because if you want to think back a little bit um, and say, consider the US, it became the world's biggest economy towards the end of the 19th century. It was happy to free ride on the uh, British gold standard, on the security provided by the Royal Navy, while at the same time, um, you know, enforcing the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, so, you know, why should we act, uh, expect China to act any otherwise? Another good question. Well, unfortunately, uh, uh, Young was, uh, was out when you asked your question about human rights, and I would have thrown it to him. Uh, and uh, given the backgrounds and other, others up here, I, I'm probably the closest to uh, someone who should attend an, an answer. And I'd just say that uh, these issues are uh, immensely complex in China. The, the, uh, the social change, the, the political change that shapes the environment for human rights is immensely complex and, uh, and fluid. I think that uh, Stephen Smith said, put, put uh, one uh, uh, context on that uh, uh, this morning. He noted, that's the Minister for Foreign Affairs, he noted the uh, uh, the huge expansion of uh, the, the uh, uh, of personal freedoms and uh, capacity for uh, personal interaction, uh, alongside the absence of change in the superstructure of the state and the uh, the political system. Uh, in these uh, update conferences uh, over uh, recent years, we've uh, addressed the question from time to time of whether and how the political structure will have to change to accommodate the more complex society and economy that's emerging. Uh, both uh, uh, Yao Yang and uh, uh, Yung Zhang uh, uh, earlier today discussed dimensions of that and uh, Yang's chapter in the, in the update volume uh, uh, addresses that question, addresses the particular question of uh, uh, of the power that uh, vested interest groups uh, come to exert 
uh, if they get control of political levers in a, a highly centralised uh, political system uh, and how democratisation might be uh, uh, the only solution to that. Uh, we were alerted, I think, from, by our friend from uh, the National University of Singapore in, in the morning session that, uh, that the democratic West also has a problem of uh, uh, capture of policy-making processes by business interests. And the discussion of these matters in the rest of the world feeds back into discussion within the Chinese Communist Party uh, on the... Uh, uh, the, the, the value and the risks of, uh, uh, of political structural reform in the direction of democratisation. I, I, I don't, don't know if, if, I presume you have, but uh, uh, whether you have or not, it's important to read uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the memoirs of uh, Zhao Ziyang, prisoner uh, of the state, and I think that gives you a feel uh, for the complexity of the issues, how uh, a, a, a man with a huge brain uh, understanding very well all of the pressures on Chinese society as it goes through uh, this uh, process of immense economic growth uh, uh, will need to change political structure uh, but despite his own personal uh, experience um, an understanding of the constraints, the complexity, the speed limits uh, on that uh, on that process. But anyone else in the panel? I, I just add to that, Ross, if I can. Uh, I mean, we all uh, carry uh, uh, baggage to our international dealings, uh, which affect our reputation in various ways and damage uh, our own interests in the international community. Uh, and uh, uh, China, no less uh, than others. Uh, uh, I think uh, when you distill that particular question into its hard political and practical content, which I think you have to to make any sense of it, frankly, uh, I think uh, the point, and I think Ross is touching upon this, the point really is, I think, uh, very much focused on uh, political system reform, which reassures the international community as uh, China and its dealings with the world chafes against its own baggage, as it were, reassures the international community that uh, there is a system in place uh, that's representative of uh, interests uh, that uh, might be oppressed in some way or other. Uh, and, uh, and that's the big challenge. I think uh, if I look forward for 20 years, uh, uh, even for 10 years, I think that's a challenge that presses upon the Chinese polity more than any other challenge in respect uh, not only of its uh, reputation in the international community, but also in the success uh, of uh, its economy in the next decade or two. Uh, because I think these things will come to matter more and more and more as uh, various entities, businesses and so on, as they must inevitably uh, in closer dealings with uh, their <coughs> counterparts in the international economy, uh, a press upon these issues, uh, as uh, we've seen a little bit so far, but only a little bit so far. Those things will become more and more important, uh, very much more rapidly, I think, uh, than many people in the past may have imagined, because of the scale uh, and the intimacy of what's now involved in China's dealings with the rest of the world. Uh, it's huge. It's not a question of China's becoming big in 10 years' time or 20 years' time. China's already big. Uh, it's already the biggest trading partner of Australia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, you know, half of the region. It'll be the biggest trading partner of every economy in our region uh, within eight to 10 years' time. No question. Uh, and that's on incredibly conservative assumptions. Uh, and then, of course, just the scale of it uh, globally is so, so important. So these things do come to matter. And we all have to attend to our reputation, not only in our political dealings in the international community, but also in our economic dealings in the international community. So there is an international dimension to the, all that was said before about how important 
uh, in the sessions this morning about how important uh, political transformation <coughs> will be in managing China's internal problems. Uh, while, you've, while you've got the microphone, Peter, uh, uh, I'll get both, <laughs> both, you, both, <laughs> both you and, uh, both you and uh, Wing to uh, 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 respond to the question about what incentives does China to have to behave any differently? What incentives to not to depend on the British Navy globally <laughs> and run the, run the Monroe Doctrine uh, in the Americas? Let uh, <laughs> Wing start. <laughs> Uh, the emergence is true. The United States was a free rider. It inherited the world order from the British after, after the World War I. Why couldn't China play the same strategy of being a free rider? There, have, there are two changes in the world since then, which makes the rest of the world unable to accept China as a free rider. The first change that has occurred is technological. Until 1945, no one had the power to be able to destroy the world. But thanks to the atomic bomb, one country has the ability to harm the welfare of everyone collectively. So unless China stops this, uh, uh, takes a more active role in the prevention of nuclear proliferation, the rest of the world would not like to see it being a free rider. After all, how did Pakistan get to become the seller of nuclear technology worldwide? It, how did Pakistan get the bomb in the first place? After India exploded the bomb, China passed the technology to Pakistan, its long-time ally. What China did not count on was that Pakistan would then commercialize technology, selling it to North Korea, which China didn't want it to go there. And then it went on to sell it to Iran, Syria, and a whole host of other places. The second change that has occurred that makes the world less willing to see a free rider coming on board is the fact that until China came on board, we were not hitting any ecological constraints. In other words, the amount of CO2 that was being spilled out was not going to bring us to a level of global warming that would decimate the human race or, or the wiping out of a significant variety of species. It's like when I live alone by the river, the water was still clean enough for everyone downstream. Until you arrived and brought your family to live alongside me, then the river became terrible, uh, non-drinkable for the community downstream. So what is this about historic burden? <clears throat> Everything was going fine until you came along and pushed us hmm. towards the eco global ecological constraint. I think that this is the big difference. When the U.S. rise, in the U.S. didn't have the technological, there, there was no such technology around the world, such that if we all don't control it, it would destroy all of us. And it wasn't pushing the world towards an ecological constraint. But let us ask, does this free rider always end up with getting what you want? I think that's the only case. If you look at the rise of countries in the 20th century, only the U.S. rise has been a peaceful and stabilizing one. The rise of Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union <coughs> was certainly resisted. And the case of the Soviet Union actively contained by the existing global power. And why? I think that had to do with the changes in technology that had occurred, which was, I think, a primary reason for the U.S. strategy of containment that came about. So would China, would, a threat, would an outcome be containment, given the fact that we no longer can accept free riders, given the two changes that I've talked about? There are other changes I could, I could mention, but they are, they are more minor compared to these two. 
Well, that's a pretty big answer. I think we'll save Peter for uh, another question. Um, now, we've got, had a couple of questions about resource uh, constraints. Uh, Li Gang? Maybe I uh, start with uh, some use questions about uh, food security. Uh, China has 7% uh, of uh, world arable land and uh, feeding uh, about 20% of the world total population. So the food security is a real issue. With the rising population and the falling uh, arable land every year, so uh, that, that is a real issue. I, I think hope uh, really lies at three aspects. Number one is the agricultural reform. The second one is the technology. The third one is the uh, international open trading regime. So uh, that, that is the, uh, this of the uh, food security problem. Back to the question of John, I think it is uh, very interesting about a uh, future pattern of international migration centering on Chinese economy. And uh, that's a very significant one. But I would just, just like to point out, there's uh, some alternative way of doing that. Just exactly what happened in the developed countries. When the, uh, the, the cost of uh, production increases, they shift the, uh, the, the, uh, the industry offshore. So instead of uh, import the labor from other countries, they set up factories in the, uh, uh, in the countries where the, the labor costs are relatively low. So China is exactly doing that right now. And uh, investing from China to the Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Central Asia is used the labor more cheaply uh, abroad uh, than, than in China. So that is there. Back to Richard's question, I think it's uh, also very significant. Again, I think the, uh, probably the issues are dealing with that one, uh, less or three, three things. Number one is the pricing. And in China, prices are very much distorted uh, still. So therefore, <coughs> pricing the resources uh, according to the market prices can improve the efficiency of utilizing the resources. The second one is the structural changes. And the third one is the, is the technology. Q, uh, in presenting our work, is already talking about the possibility of leapfrogging. That is uh, really encouraging. If that happens, you know, you produce a one unit of output, output but you use a less unit of, uh, of energy and, uh, and, uh, and uh, resources. So that's the, uh, the possibility of, 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 of the structural change and technology. Again, after uh, the oil crisis in 1970s, Japan actually offered a good example and uh, radically changed this is economic structure, enhancing that the technology changes, and uh, the energy intensity is just like a, a real model. So if China can follow the pattern of Japan, I think there's, there's some hope. Thanks. And just another word about, uh, uh, about food. I've just concluded a uh, fairly long spell as chairman of the International Food Policy Research Institute. And uh, 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 over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, since the mid-70s, uh, the issue of uh, food constraints uh, has fallen off the uh, agenda a bit because we've gone through a period of uh, uh, late last century of very rapid uh, uh, productivity growth, very rapid uh, increase in yields uh, in, in agriculture, su supported by a uh, big increase in uh, both public and private investment in research. Uh, uh, on agriculture. There are some questions about uh, whether that flow of resources t uh, for uh, public investment in uh, research in agriculture uh, is continuing at an adequate uh, uh, level. Uh, but uh, a couple of other things have happened that uh, are, are favourable uh, and uh, uh, the, the land resources of the Latin America, South American and uh, African continents are actually very large, good agricultural land uh, re resources. Uh, uh, the, uh, both the political structures, uh, institutional structures haven't been favorable for uh, agricultural uh, development, but uh, that has all been changing. One of the important global developments in the early uh, 21st century uh, uh, is the, uh, the, the huge improvement of policies and institutions for uh, uh, economic development in uh, Africa and uh, uh, Latin America. Uh, and uh, uh, that's already contributing to uh, uh, helping to balance the very rapid growth in demand for food associated with rising incomes uh, in China uh, India, uh, Indonesia, Brazil, and a number of other developing countries. All of these countries are at an income level where increased incomes uh, leads to quite strong growth in 
demand for high quality food, uh, which is much more demanding on uh, on uh, resources than uh, the, the basic grains, which uh, are important at lower levels of income. Uh, so. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the overall uh, uh, risks, uh, I, I think, can probably be managed so long as there is not a large climatic shock, uh, but uh, uh, the, the work of well, all of the serious agricultural research groups uh, globally uh, has focused on the risks associated with substantial changes uh, in climate. If climate changes, even if we get the same average uh, rainfall, <coughs> but the rain falls in different places, human uh, um, civilization, human habitations developed around an established pattern of, uh, 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 of climate and uh, disruption of that. Uh, could hugely uh, challenge uh, global uh, uh, food supplies. Can I just briefly say, um, also, also efficient supply, agricultural reform and efficient supply chains, which often raise big competition questions. Thanks. And so questions or comments on the domestic uh, challenges of reform and development in the next 20 years? Please. Hi, um, this is Jenny Fu from University of Canberra. Uh, I know Professor um, Ross Garnot and uh, Professor Song are experts on Chinese SOE reform. Uh, now China has a strategy, I think it's called ever bigger have a stronger, large um, SOEs. I, I'm wondering uh, what's your view on this strategy? Uh, do you think it's better off for China if the governments um, allocate more financial resources to the private sector rather than the, uh, in the big SOEs? Um, I'm not uh, really an economics, so probably my question is not that economist. <laughs> well, uh, Yang Yao worked with Li Gang and I, and and you can probably hear Li Gang and my views many times around here. So I'm going to ask uh, Yang to uh, answer that question. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, we, we did a project together uh, looking at uh, uh, privatization in China. But currently, uh, the, if you look at the SOE sector, the total amount of profits is about one trillion RMB. One trillion RMB. So many people say, let's uh, uh, div uh, give those money to people so our consumption will, will rise. I really don't think so. Because this is a very small amount of money compared with uh, uh, the size of China's economy. Right? Uh, but among the, those uh, one trillion, about 60% is contributed by centrally owned SOEs, those 140 some. And among those 140 some, only about like 10 to 20 are really making money. Uh, so basically we are talking about like a Petro China, uh, you know, China Telecom, something like that. The SOEs uh, are really uh, just uh, sucking in resources and without uh, uh, real productivity uh, increase in the last several years. So in that case, uh, uh, I believe the, the government is doing the wrong thing to give us so much credit to those SOEs. Uh, my question is for the Professor Ross Garnett and uh, Max Gordon. Uh, uh, last year, the State Council has started the experiment uh, to, use, uh, to use RMB in China's import and export. Uh, in my view, in the next 20 years, uh, the most significant uh, monetary phenomenon is the rise of the RMB in the world. And do you think uh, the Chinese currency will become an important international currency? And uh, do you think uh, what, are, what are the impact, implications if Chinese, China, Chinese currency become an important uh, international currency, and uh, in, if this goal is worthwhile to achieve, and what should China do to to do to realize that? Thank you. I think that's for Max. Yeah, that's for me. <laughs> Interesting. Many people asked me that question when I was in Beijing 
recently. In fact, I was interviewed by the Xinhua, uh, what do you call it? Xinhua Agency, uh, and it was on the web, and they asked me that question, so I'll give you the same answer, <laughs> basically. So it's a very important point, you know. We have to ask ourselves, how does a currency, has a, how has the dollar and earlier sterling, how have they become international currencies? Now, let me, a little, might take a minute to, to expand it yeah. properly, you know. Um, the way, let's think about the dollar for a moment, that gives us an idea of what could happen in this case. After the war, the Americans exported a lot of long-term capital to Europe. They set up branches and uh, subsidiaries of companies in France and so on. Now, as they sent out this capital, the uh, Europeans acquired dollars. Which were, and then those dollars were deposited short term in the New York market. So now, France held dollars, while the United States held long term capital in France. Okay? And now, uh, you had the situation where the United States uh, was in fact uh, um, borrowing short term from Europe and was in fact a reserve currency country for Europe, while in, in, on the other side of it, the uh, uh, Americans were owners of long-term capital and they were, you might say, lending to France. Right? Now, so one way in which a country becomes a um, international um, currency, in that sense, a reserve currency, is if it has been exporting capital. That's one way. Now take a second way. Suppose that um, a country runs a current account deficit. Uh, not a surplus now, like China, and the current account deficit. Uh, that means that um, uh, it has to pay, I got the right way around? Uh, it, it gives credit, I'm sorry, that's right. It gives credits to countries in dollars, right? And so again, the countries with which it trades acquire dollars. And now again, the uh, uh, United States is an international uh, uh, currency because other countries are holding dollars. So two ways of, uh, of uh, becoming an international currency are to run a current account deficit or to export long-term capital. Now, uh, China so far is not exporting long-term capital, and of course, as you know, it's running a surplus and not a deficit. You know, there's a third way, and I'm going to explain that as follows. Take, a, another, uh, take um, um, Indonesia. At the moment, they're holding dollar reserves. And they say, well, we don't like holding dollar reserves. We'd rather like to hold reserves at RMB, okay? So they take the dollars away from the United States, and they go to uh, the bank, of, uh, the People's Bank of China, knock knock, and says, "Look, we've got dollars here. Uh, give us uh, your currency. We'll hold that as reserves." And in this way, uh, China would indeed become an international currency for Indonesia. And this could be done by all the other uh, Asian countries. And then you, you have what you want. But now. China is holding a lot more dollars, and it wouldn't want to do that. I mean, now that China has too many dollars, we'd like to spread its reserves around. We'd like to hold some other currencies, might try some Australian dollars, or yen, or uh, euros, maybe. But um, that's not actually a practical thing to do, and wouldn't be any good for China to, um, uh, to take other countries' dollars and then give the other countries RMBs because the China has even more dollars. It's got far too many already. So it's not practical, in fact. It will only become practical if China either exports long-term capital or if it runs current account um, uh, deficits. In addition, of course, it must have a good capital market you know, for people to want to hold the currency. And I mean, one of the great attractions of the United States is that it is a very liquid uh, capital market. Yes. Can, can I add, add it to the uh, professor code? Uh, I think that you, you know, in the euro sense that uh, I fully agree with you. you. You have to either run deficit or you export uh, uh, your, your your capital. You know, holding like a, a long term each your long term debt. I see in the China Chinese case, uh, maybe in this case uh, because China is holding huge 
uh, dollar reserves. Yeah. Let me give it uh, RMB some strength. And like, uh, let's suppose that, uh, now Chinese government starts to issue loans denominate in RMB. I think that's possible. That's going. You know, the, uh, people are going to have confidence uh, in the value of R RMB. Right. So in the end, they are going to return their loans in RMB, and we, in that case, and which is already happening in you know, surrounding countries, RMB is a hard currency, so they can convert RMB into local currency, and then in the end, convert back uh, the RMB again to re to return the loans. So I think that that might be possible for for China to make RMB kind of international a currency. It's a very long-term technique. It's a very long-term technique. Short, short, short. Uh, short. Last question. Okay. My sense is, I just wanted to ask, you do need to run this. I guess this one's a little bit of a curly one. Um, just throwing it out there, what we're seeing now with uh, rising Chinese nationalism and increased Chinese voice and uh, opinions about policy making, I was wondering what you thought of nationalist pressure on Chinese economic policy, be it by Chinese, be it boycotts on certain products. We saw protests against Japan in 2005, uh, 2008, a uh, movement against Carrefour shops. If we're going to see something like that and uh, what implications that has. Who'd like to take that on? Nigan, you like to? Hard <laughs> question. <laughs> it happened when the, uh, I think before the Olympics, and uh, when the uh, the Prime Minister of Japan visit uh, Yasakuni Shrine, and the Chinese uh, nurse through the internet, it's a, people, it's a, it's a boy called Japanese uh, goods, and uh, sold in China. And, uh, and a few other occasions it's happened uh, in, in the past. I, I think generally, the, uh, with the reform of the past 30 years, the society is, uh, yes, of, of course, we know this, uh, the historical reasons and, uh, and the center between Japan and China. Even now, you know, some problem is uh, between China and other countries. So the national feeling certainly is there. But uh, there's another trend. If you look at the past 30 years, the society is progressively become open and open. And in the next 20 years, China will be the largest economy in the world. So therefore, I think that sentiment will change again. Because the world community will expect China to be not narrowly focused, you know, just consider their own interests. You have to be a responsible player in the world. And uh, according to uh, 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 Angus Madison, just before he passed away a few weeks ago, he, he wrote an article contributing to our book. And uh, his, his prediction about, uh, you know, by 2030, China will be the largest economy. But in the latest work, he said, uh, according to PPP ter terms, China will surpass the United States by 2015, so in, in five years' time. So I think these kind of uh, the changes are also, you know, feed back to the thinking of China and uh, to position themselves or design themselves in the way that is the, uh, to become a very open society and uh, be a member of the world community and for, the, for, the, uh, for dealing with the, uh, the common issues like uh, climate change, like, uh, like uh, poverty. And uh, so the China will in the next 20 years will become, uh, you know, rich, not very rich, but certainly, you know, yeah, it's a quite uh, affluent society. But it's not the end of the uh, development. We know the poverty, we know the world population will increase from uh, 6 billion to 9 billion in the next 30 years. So all these are come with the responsibility. So I think along the way, the society has to be adjusting itself towards uh, uh, reaching that goal. <laughs> Thanks. Wing. I understand your question is asking if those kind of acts of economic nationalism would increase. I would think that it depends on the following. What is the basis of political legitimacy for the present government? Good economic performance and representative of political nationalism. So if the economy ever falters, we will see that the government will have to rely on the greater use of the second leg of its legitimacy. So I think if, the, if it's bright economic sunshine, we are unlikely to see too much of that. But if the Chinese economy were to stumble, I think we'll see more of it. Peter? Yeah, I think in, in, in looking at that sort of issue, and experience suggests that uh, uh, how important uh, the international 
norms and commitment to the international norms are. Sometimes we think of the WTO as a, not a very robust instrument for constraining national or nationalist behaviour in this context, but in, in fact it's proven to be remarkably important in the development of China's relation, relation, economic relationships with uh, some of the partners uh, with whom it has the biggest relationships. Japan, for example, where uh, there are political perturbations in the relationship. You, you might have thought uh, from a superficial, superficial ob observation of, of uh, reactions uh, to those uh, developments uh, from time to time uh, would have disturbed the relationship substantially. But as, uh, as Shiro Armstrong here has shown with careful analysis of these things, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there's been remarkable little impact. Uh, these uh, disturbances have remarkable little impact uh, on the economic relationship between <coughs> Japan uh, and, and China. Uh, and that's importantly because both countries are part of an international system and that international system uh, guarantees or secures open and confident com commerce between the individuals in Japan, the enterprises in Japan and in China who are engaging in business. Uh, people go for the cheap goods or the quality goods and so on and that is sustained around the disturbances that might be uh, in political relationships of that kind. That's a very important and fundamental point and it's a very important point in considering uh, how the relationships with China uh, going forward as China, as Li Gang has described, inevitably becomes a more and more important player in the international economy will be sustained, as the Chinese say, harmoniously. Or not. <laughs> well, uh, I'll get, give each of the members of the panel a chance, if they wish to take it, don't have to, uh, to, to make some final comment. Uh, Max? I haven't said that much, so I have a go now. <laughs> but it seems to me that the rise of China is one of the greatest historic developments that have ever taken place. If you just consider the number of persons who have been taken out of poverty, compared to what all the other, with the World Bank and all the Oxfam and all of them, none of them are equal in numbers to the imp favorable impact that uh, ch uh, ch it all began with one man, Deng Xiaoping, didn't it really? Uh, that it made on world, um, on humanity. We talk about human rights, and I agree, of course, there are lots of important human rights, and all of us should set a good example, other countries. But one human right is to, not to be poor, miserable. And China has made a fantastic uh, uh, impact there. We, could, we must look favourably. Now it's also true when a, big, when a country becomes so big economically that has a whole lot of pluses and minuses around the world which are going to make a big impact. Uh, the main point is China imports more and that benefits the suppliers like Australia and, it's harm, and, and oil exporters and it's harmful for countries that don't have oil and don't have iron ore, raises prices to them. So it's always going to be losers. And on the export side, well, all of us, the beneficiaries, when we go to the shops and buy these cheap goods, uh, high-quality goods, cheap goods from China, <laughs> and, uh, and then there are losers, of course. There are losers. And always the losers make more noise than the gainers. And I think we have to just, the world has to live with that. That is part of the cost of a vast number of people ceasing to be poor. And I think that should give us perspective. Thanks, Max. Uh, Stephen, final remarks? Uh, well, just to put the uh, climate change hasn't figured much, but to put it in that broader context of China being a free rider, I wouldn't say China was a free rider on climate change, but it certainly is a follower uh, in, in the international negotiations. It's all, right being, it's all right being a follower if the leader is doing a good job, right? but if the leader themselves is, uh, is not leading, you know, you don't want to be a follower. I mean, that's, that's a problem. You know, that's one of the real difficulties in climate change, that it's caught up. Uh, in this, you know, the, the rising star and, and the falling star. And I, and I guess climate change in that sense is just an example. You know, there are any number of looming catastrophes uh, that the world's unable to uh, respond to effectively uh, because of this, uh, it's caught up in this power battle. And, and while Copenhagen overall was a failure, I mean, one of the interesting things was at the end, you know, the Europeans were cut out and it was really a deal between the US and China that, uh, got, that got us to where uh, whatever Copenhagen achieved uh, was due to that deal. And, and it'll be the next US-China deal, you know, whenever it is, 
whatever it is that takes us to the next stage in, uh, in, in climate change and, and the other big global problems. Uh, Alan? <coughs> I, I just mentioned competition law and policy, but of course uh, there's a wider set of problems touched on briefly today, the regulatory challenge in health, safety, environment, and a number of other areas. Uh, we haven't done a terrific job in developed countries. The challenge for China is also massive there. Uh, any other members of the panel want to make final remark? Just one uh, <laughs> one remark uh, about the followers and 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 uh, being a follower uh, when there's no leadership uh, is not a very desirable state of affairs. Uh, I agree uh, uh, in response to the comment uh, that uh, uh, historically we've seen uh, the leaders follow in accepting responsibilities in the provision of international public goods, uh, but uh, those of you who are old enough uh, will remember uh, that that wasn't an entirely, uh, <laughs> entirely benign period in human history. Uh, and why it wasn't an entirely benign period in human history uh, was that there were not enough uh, international public goods of the right kind provided under those circumstances. Uh, and this. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of reasons, as, uh, as Wing has explained, why, why China doesn't step readily and quickly up to the mark in this respect, and they're very understandable. Uh, there's a focus on domestic problems, there's the, the policy psychology of, uh, uh, of uh, having to uh, develop uh, the capacities to be sort of internationally literate. Uh, there's huge capacities in China policy making processes, but are they adequate to the task? They're not adequate to the task at this time. So this takes time, but it's an urgent task because uh, the impact of China on the international system now is so big and so pressing that China has to be con conscious of the important feedback effects that there will be on uh, its own success if it doesn't attend to those uh, responsibilities in the provision of international public goods. Uh, I just want to add um, Peter and the Wing's uh, points on China uh, to play a more active role in the international stage. I mean, they talk about the, uh, the things uh, from uh, the perspective of other countries. I think uh, from China's uh, own perspective, uh, China should uh, play a more active role in international stage because China is so integrated in the world economic and political system. And we have a huge states in the system. If we want to sustain our growth and also to sustain our political status in the world stage, we have to actively uh, we involved in the decision making process uh, of international affairs. Uh, but of course, uh, I also understand why the Chinese government, Ch especially Chinese leaders, are not doing that. Uh, basically, to me, I think because of the indeterminacy of China uh, in the world system. Uh, that is, uh, to be a leader, continue to be a leader of the developing world, or to join the kind of a decision group which is dominated by the developed world. I think China has not made up its mind. And also uh, because of the lack uh, of human capitals, we really do not have the adequate uh, human capital to deal with the international affairs. Uh, look at the Copenhagen uh, conference. Uh, I mean, many of the, the things that kind of irregularities, Chinese government officials, uh, displayed in that convention is basically because of lack of human capital. Uh, they really don't have that kind of expertise to deal with complicated uh, international affairs. Thanks, Young. Uh, well, now we'll bring things to a, a close. We've, I think we're in a fair equilibrium during the day. We answered a few questions, but we've raised a few more. Uh, so uh, we're, we, we've got the number of unanswered questions at the beginning of the day. I think in the presentations today and in the discussion, we've filled a couple of gaps in the book. Uh, the uh, uh, very welcome uh, 
contributions of Cheng Wei on, uh, on demography and the discussion we've had of that. Uh, Andrew Watson's uh, c uh, comments on uh, the social security system. And we saw some of the, uh, the links uh, between uh, the, the de demography and the social security in the discussion of uh, Cheng Wei's uh, remarks. We've had a fair bit of discussion of uh, the, the labor market uh, turning period. Uh, we don't have here today, uh, and I'm very pleased that we, that we don't have him, uh, Tsai Fung, our colleague, who did an excellent chapter for the book. Uh, he's uh, uh, involved in uh, some very high-level uh, policy advice, uh, and uh, China uh, th does well the more advice its leaders take seriously from Tsai Fung. But I uh, just draw attention to things he would have said, things in his chapter. Uh, he, uh, uh, the Institute of uh, Population and Labor Studies uh, in um, uh, the Chinese Academy of Social <laughs> Sciences, and Tsai Fung is the director, has uh, uh, done some terrific uh, uh, survey work and uh, analysis of uh, surveys uh, uh, from, from, the, from the census, from the mini census as the China periodically runs, from the agricultural surveys. and. Uh, uh, and, and also uh, brought to account uh, a very broad set of da data on labour market behaviour. And Tsai Feng uh, talks about an acceleration of uh, the rate of, gr of growth of real wages from about 2004 that was briefly but only briefly interrupted by the uh, financial crisis and which is now continuing strongly. Uh, and. Uh, well, when and uh, uh, this was the centre of a uh, an important uh, seminar or workshop, really uh, uh, coordinated by uh, uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, um, Tsai Feng's group, and uh, Yiping Huang at uh, Peking University, with support from University of Melbourne and ANU, uh, on the, the question of the labour market turning period. And there's a special edition of China's main English language economic, uh, main, main economic China Economic Journal coming out uh, on this subject, <laughs> the subject, the turning point, which I can commend. But the, some, some of the essence of uh, the story is in a couple of the chapters uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the book uh, uh, that, that's... Uh, that was released last night. Um, th th this is historically enormously important. It's going to shape a lot of things about China's relations with the rest of the world and Chinese internal structural development over the next 20 years. Uh, when you combine the continued very strong growth in demand for labor from growth at 10% per annum and fairly open growth, which means that the relationship between growth and output and demand for labor is fairly strong. Uh, and uh, uh, and the demographic crunch, the uh, stabilization and soon the decline uh, in uh, uh, the, the labor force and uh, uh, the, the huge increase in education investment per person in China from an expanding in education budget and a declining number of ch kids, uh, which means that the, uh, the, the, the numbers of uh, unskilled workers relative to uh, uh, to, to demand is, is, is going to go through a, a sort of crunch that wasn't seen in Japan, uh, which went through its turning point in economic development in the early 60s at a different stage of its demographic uh, transition, which uh, hasn't been felt elsewhere. Now, uh, almost certainly rapidly growing real wages will be associated uh, with a, a, a shift uh, uh, from uh, uh, income uh, uh, to going to capital at the moment, to income going to labour. Uh, that's got big implications for income distribution. Uh, Tsai Fung's work suggests that already we are seeing, uh, when you look carefully at the data, uh, a reversal of the long-term tendency for uh, the wages share of uh, GDP to fall uh, in the Chinese economy and for, as a result for income inequality to increase. Well, we may be reaching the point where for these labour market reasons that is changing. Uh, it's, it's likely to be the case that uh, households uh, save less uh, uh, as a proportion of their income than businesses, so a shift from the uh, profit share to uh, the wage share will lead to reduction of savings. And whether it's 
good or not for China, uh, and good or not for the rest of the world, we've had a very good discussion of that today, there's likely to be less uh, uh, Chinese surplus savings available for international investment. Uh, some congressmen for a moment will, will cheer, uh, but not so much when that uh, immense uh, US public debt, 100% of GDP, has to be funded at uh, substantially higher uh, interest rates. Uh, and uh, taxes have to rise in the United States uh, to simply to fund uh, the interest commitments because the, the U.S. government uh, uh, can't default. Uh, so uh, 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 that, that's going to be a big part of the story of the next 20 years uh, in China. In the discussion of, of climate change, which has come in a number of places during the day, uh, including... Um, very good uh, presentations uh, from the two Professor Jungs, but uh, 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 the, the, we've focused mainly on uh, the challenge of the mitigation effort in China and whether China's doing a lot or, uh, or little, if it's doing a lot, whether it's doing enough. Uh, but we haven't focused so much on another dimension of that, and that's the consequences of failure. Uh, the really big consequences for uh, uh, environment, uh, of environmental catastrophe, catastrophe for China are likely to come through global climate change rather than through anything in China. All of the local environmental problems are being uh, addressed uh, at a relatively early stage of China's uh, process of incomes growth because people want them corrected. Uh, but uh, uh, one country alone uh, can't uh, cure the the world's uh, climate problem, and by 2030, uh, if there's no mitigation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, if, if uh, all countries for the next 20 years behave like Australia at the moment, uh, then, uh, uh, then by 2030, uh, capital markets will be, uh, financial markets will be pricing in uh, the, uh, the high likelihood of major disruption uh, to the global economy. Uh, China by then will be a rich country. Uh, the rich countries will do better than other countries. They will be able to... Uh, uh, we'll all move to Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Sorry, Munich. Yeah. And we Australians will all move to Tasmania. I won't be alive, but you will. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but, but I, I was glad that at the end of the discussion, of, I think, of uh, 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 Hugh Mackay's paper, there was, was recognition of the consequences uh, uh, of, of failure, and we, we should keep that in mind when we're talking about the prospects uh, of China and of everywhere else for 2030. Um, uh, we, we've had a very good discussion through the day of uh, China's impact on the global economy and uh, international system and some important uh, uh, ideas uh, have been put out and uh, tested and looked at from a number of points of view uh, and I, I think it's been a rich discussion of, of those things. China as uh, a regime uh, maker or, uh, or taker and if that's one issue I think, on which I think there is a bit of a consensus that uh, uh, in the modern world, uh, the, the world and China can't afford to have the world's biggest economy as a regime taker because too much is at stake uh, and uh, it's not obvious who else will provide uh, global uh, leadership. China's got to be part of building the international system in which uh, uh, it will make its way. Uh, in the volume, uh, there's two uh, uh, very important papers on how China's domestic political system will, will have to uh, evolve uh, in response to, uh, uh, to, to the changing uh, economy. Uh, Yongcheng Zhang focusing on uh, uh, central uh, provincial financial relations, but that's got very rich uh, political dimensions. And uh, uh, Yang Yao's uh, discussion of uh, uh, of the problems of the current political system, uh, its vulnerability uh, to capture by vested interests, uh, and uh, the problems for Chinese uh, uh, policy of, uh, of not providing checks and balances and constraints uh, uh, on that. Uh, we, we haven't discussed that so much during the day, 
Uh, but uh, they're obviously uh, critical issues uh, for uh, the success of China over the next 20 years. Um, uh, well, uh, I won't try to uh, do anything by way of summary, enough just to point out some of the, the big uh, issues that we've touched upon. Uh, an event like this uh, requires uh, lots of uh, support from lots of people for success. Uh, we're grateful to the Rio Tinto Partnership for providing funding for a lot of our China work at the ANU, uh, to OSAID for uh, continued support, uh, for especially for uh, Chinese scholars uh, uh, participating uh, in our work um, at ANU, <coughs> to uh, ANU ePress uh, uh, for uh, uh, developing, the, producing the volume under extraordinary pressure. Um, it's that sort of pressure every year. This is the only conference anywhere that produces the volume on the day of the conference. Uh, and uh, that, that's hard work for everyone, but especially for the press. Uh, thanks to uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and the uh, academic press of China. Uh, who uh, take the work from here, translate it and publish it in China and uh, uh, our work is well known in China th uh, for that. Thanks uh, for our colleagues, uh, a couple of whom are with us uh, today. Um, and of course thanks to all the contributors to the book who have worked under great pressure uh, to uh, and lots of uh, wh uh, whiplashes, uh, mainly from uh, uh, from Jane this year, uh, trying to uh, get all of the things uh, together in time, all the chapters together in time uh, for publication. Uh, Dennis Kenny uh, has been uh, the principal figure organising uh, the whole event. Thanks, uh, Dennis. Uh, the staff from 